Riot, ruin, and the fuel of hate. There is a day coming this November that may define what remains of America. Up until now, I had reserved a small hope that peace would win out. That hope evaporated recently when I read a Facebook post from a local woman who lives and works right down the road from me. It is called Confessions of a Hater. And keep in mind, at no point is the president's name mentioned. I am a hater. I hate him. I hate everything about him. I hate his incessant lies, his crimes, his treatment of women. I hate his racism. I hate what he is doing to this country, the division, the neglect, the dismantling of our democracy. I hate that he ripped babies away from their parents and is holding them in cages while they suffer irreversible damage and nightmarish trauma. I hate his cold, lifeless heart. I hate that he is trying to destroy our ability to vote so that he and his handlers can more easily steal the election. I hate how he panders to the morbidly rich and crushes the poor and middle class under his tin pot dictator boot. I hate how he uses the office of the presidencies for his own ego and personal gain. I hate his stupid, ugly offspring except for that poor, sad young one. I hate that he is a traitor and has no loyalty to this country, but only to himself. I hate that he insisted in covering his entire apartment in 24 karat gold. I hate his ugly face, his sickening voice, and his immoral disdain for everything good. I hate his creepy lizard eyes that look upon all they see as something to control or consume. I hate that he is working to steal and destroy Social Security and the U.S. Postal Service. I hate him more than I have ever hated anything, and I hate that he has turned me into a hater. I also hate that hatred is really the only appropriate emotion to have for such an entirely deplorable monster. I hate the ignorance of the people that actually support this pile of filth. I hate that they do this bidding and enable him while pretending to be pro-life. I hate the extreme angst, bewilderment, and frustration I feel towards them. I'm disgusted by the utterly incomprehensible acceptance and even adoration that they feel for him. I hate that they are helping to destroy this country, that they consume the actual fake news to the point where it has led them into a state of mass infectious psychosis and they scare me. I hate that, and I don't know how to address it without sounding like the hater that I am. I'd like to rise above being a hater, be more like Gandhi, Jesus, Buddha, Winnie the Pooh, but for now, it's just me, and I'm a hater. That was just one Democrat letter from a woman living on a rural island north of Seattle. And most of the comments that followed were sympathetic and supported her position. That's just part of the unique intensity that is the 2020 election. Between the polarizing candidates and the virus hysteria that has crippled most of the known world, both sides have so much emotional investment in this decision that there will be a firestorm backlash regardless of who wins. I have a friend who thinks that the election may not even happen, but we won't address that today. Let's say that everything limps along and that we actually have a decision the first week of November. The Republicans of this country know full well that if Trump wins, the civil rights destruction we saw in the cities earlier in the year will be just a speed bump compared to what's coming. The short version is that if Trump wins, cities will literally burn. Orange man, bad. Orange flames, good. What they don't know is that the left will set up shop in Washington, D.C. weeks before the election to prepare for either outcome. Why would they do this? Well, why do people go to the Super Bowl or World Cup? 
because win or lose, the emotional energy has to go somewhere. Everything before that will be a lot of posturing and false confidence. Remember that it's not really an election, it's a selection. The powers that be know full well who the winner will be far in advance. The Democrats will stage large, mostly peaceful groups with lots of noise, maybe some music, but it will be primarily positive because the outcome hasn't been decided. Once a winner is picked, everything changes. If Trump wins, the mob will try to engage the White House directly, and there will be thousands of them. If the administration plays it safe, the White House will raise the steel wall system days ahead of time. This will stop the protesters from a head-on conflict with Secret Service, but will do little to stop the defacing of national monuments like the Lincoln and Jefferson memorials, let alone the Capitol. For that, the National Guard will need to be deployed earlier in the week. DC police doesn't have nearly enough manpower to deal with this sort of crowd. What's interesting is that if Biden wins, the reaction isn't much different. A large Democratic crowd who just won the big game will want to rub the president's face in it, so they aren't going anywhere. Granted, their mood will be better, but again, the energy has to go somewhere. Also keep in mind that the average unruly mob isn't well-versed in political protocol. If Trump loses, he still gets to stay in the White House for another two months until Biden is sworn in. The mob won't like that, and will probably start chanting the predictable get out or hey, hey, ho, ho, the president has got to go. You know the deal. It will take them a while to figure out he's not leaving for some time. During that period, the monuments will still be in jeopardy because to the mob, they represent the current administration and are convinced that the removal of statues across the country will follow. Their logic will be, why not start now? There could be a sizable armed Republican crowd in DC, but it will be far outnumbered by the left, and to be honest, the emotions on the right don't run as high when it comes to candidate choice. Most of the conflicts we've seen so far have been in direct reaction to the peaceful protesting that has looted and burned scores of businesses around the nation. If Biden wins and it isn't disputed, meaning the White House publicly acknowledges the loss, then three things will happen. One small and two very large. The small thing that will happen is that every Republican that was on the fence about buying the gun will head straight to the firearm stores and max out what's left on their credit cards. Let me be clear. Do I think there will be an immediate gun grab? No. The firearms lobby is far too strong and it would take time. This isn't something that any Democratic president can just sweep across the country. Not even the US government has enough people to enforce something like that, and once you started it, word would spread and everyone would just hide all the good stuff. Don't forget that Obama leaned heavy anti-gun and nothing happened in eight years. He also said that Gitmo would be closed. He said a lot of things. All politicians do. The first big thing is that all the groups that have rioted so far, you know the ones that are demanding that the police be defunded, they will now be energized because they think if the Democrats control the White House, this will now become a reality. Those protests around the country will get much louder. The second big thing you will see immediately is a massive downturn in the stock market. I should probably frame this for people who don't know much about it or don't care. The stock market is the largest gambling house in the world. In 2008, it crashed hard. The Dow was at 9,000, and yet through some miracle, it rebounded right away despite the economic conditions never really improving. Why? It's mostly because of bonds. These are basically stocks in the USA itself. We used to sell them during World War II. You may have heard the term war bonds. You buy them like any company, and when the war is over, you get your investment plus whatever. Uh, keep in mind, you have to win the war first. What you don't know is that the government can also buy these bonds. It may seem like a conflict of interest, and well, it is. They are just printing money to buy their own stock and then flooding the market with it, and the market eventually goes up. 
that's a problem both short and long term. Short term, you are creating a disconnect between the market illusion and the market reality. Things never really got better after 2008, not for the majority of Americans. Bank interest rates never came back, housing interest rates stayed at rock bottom, and precious metals kept climbing. Gold is at, what, $2,000 an ounce right now? The long-term problem is where we are at right now. If Biden wins, the Trump administration has no motivation to keep pumping money into the markets. Trump and his staff are leaving and will want to create as much chaos as possible for the incoming Democrats. When word of this strategy gets out, all the high-powered market players will go into survival mode and sell off as quickly as possible. It won't take 60 days, trust me. The country that has already been shedding corporations and small businesses like it's the new pastime will go into a downward spiral. Less jobs, more foreclosures, more evictions, it becomes cyclical. And then there is the worst case scenario, option three, which is if the election isn't decided that week because neither side can agree on voting results. I say worst case because it's uncharted territory for the United States. Legally speaking, if the election isn't decided within 10 days, the current Speaker of the House becomes President until a decision can be reached. That's Nancy Pelosi, if you didn't know. So despite what you may have heard, there are a number of unknowns about this scenario. Feel free to ponder them and see if any result is something peaceful. As we count down the last two months before that fateful night, try to gain a calm perspective and rise above the hate. Because even the most controversial election in US history is merely a sideshow in the great circus that is upon us. The main attraction is yet to come.